Hi, welcome to tonight's conversation about parks and politics. I'm Kurt Repencheck, the host and editor-in-chief of National Parks Traveler. The Traveler is a 501c3 nonprofit media organization that focuses its coverage on national parks and protected areas. Um, and we depend greatly on reader, listener, and viewer support to get our job done and provide you guys with the latest news and information about national parks and protected areas. All our content is free, and we hope that you'll like what you read, listen to, and watch and support us with a donation. Now, for the next hour or so, we're going to be talking about pop. We're going to be talking about parks and politics. I'd venture that politics is not something that most of the roughly 300 million people who visit our national park system every year think of when they're planning their vacations, but politics definitely do impact those vacations. To drive that point home, we have two elder statesmen from the conservation slash environmental movement who have endured and navigated politics through the more than 90 combined years that they've worked in that world. Jonathan Jarvis, of course, was the, ninth, was the 18th director of the National Park Service under President Obama, and his brother Destry has a, had a long career working for the parks, first with the National Parks Conservation Association, later inside the Interior Department under the Clinton administration, and as a consultant um, thereafter. And I just lost my notes. Always an ominous start to the, the show. The, the two Jarvises have collaborated on a brand new book, National Parks Forever, 50 Years of Fighting and a Case for Independence, and are here tonight to discuss it in their vision for how to minimize, at least, political influences on the National Park Service. Towards the end of our conversation, we'll have some time for questions. But for now, I'd like to welcome John and Destry to our webinar tonight. Um, yeah, thank you, Kurt. And thank you for hosting this. And thank you for hosting the National Parks Traveler. It's been uh, great to create a conversation around the future of our national parks. Well, thanks, John. And, and that's what the Traveler is designed to do, exactly. And we, we strive every day to accomplish that. But tonight, you know, I'd like to understand, you know, where you guys got your introduction to nature, your love for the environment and, and being outdoors and led you down your career paths. I'll let the old man go first. I'm only six years old. Um, so our father was a great outdoorsman. And though I don't think we knew it when we were growing up, he was in the FDR Civilian Conservation Corps for a year and a half in his late teens and early 20s um, and developed some outdoor skills, uh, wood work and craft and so forth. But I mean, he had us each in the woods at age six and beyond um, uh, on walks and hikes and camping and so forth. Um, Boy Scouts and camping trips and 20 mile hikes and you know, all of that. Um, and then majored in biology at the College of William and Mary um, with the idea of finding some career path in natural resources. I didn't want to be a doctor, a, a medical doctor, certainly. That's what most of the William and Mary biology majors were looking for, but I wasn't. Um, I had a uh, ornithology professor named Mitchell Bird, who uh, took us on a lot of field trips. Um, and that was a terrific um, background and starter for the career path that, that I ended up on. And I would say one more thing. When I came back from Vietnam in 72, the Washington Post was full of of ads protesting the clubbing of the baby fur seals in Canada. And I volunteered for six months to lobby for the Marine Mammal Protection Act with a nonprofit called the Friends of Animals. That sort of introduced me to the passion and the politics of conservation in the broadest sense. And along the way, the people that led me to my first job at NPCA and um, late in 72, after the Marine Mammal Protection Act was, uh, was law. So I grew up 
in the same household as Destry, uh, very much uh, in the outdoors, and uh, also went to William and Mary, got a degree in biology. Um, and you guys didn't grow up in New Jersey, did you? <laughs> no, no, Virginia. Um, oh, okay. Down in the valley. Um, and backed up against national forest lands. Um, and uh, our scoutmaster was a forest ranger. So we had at least a little bit of understanding of the federal agencies out there, the land management agencies. Uh, when I graduated from college, I took off out west and hit a bunch of the national parks um, just as a, a tourist, a camper, a hiker experience. Came back <clears throat> to DC um, and crashed at Destry's um, place where he was working for NPCA at the time. And I chronicle this in the book because it was formative. He dropped on my bed the environmental impact statement for the expansion of the Jackson Hole Airport in Grand Teton National Park an issue that still is ongoing uh, and asked me to write a report for him uh, about that. And that intrigued me about the National Park Service and its, and its conservation mission. And uh, I applied for a seasonal position, landed at the Bicentennial Information Center in 1976, welcoming millions of people to, to Washington, D.C. and that uh, Never really looked back from there. That was the start of my NPS career. Yeah. Now, your book, which is just uh, hitting newsstands or hitting uh, the bookstores, you've organized it in a unique way. I mean, you introduce a topic with each chapter, and then each of you takes your turn at writing about that topic. And, and I found it very interesting. How did you settle on that approach? I think it was because we could never agree to write it together. <laughs> the 50 years of fighting has a nuance to it that there's been a lot of fighting between the two of us about topics like this. So we each have our own perspectives. And we thought that writing it in two voices, coming together at the beginning, coming together in a conclusion, but then having the two voices was a, a unique approach. And we started off with, it, at least I had the idea that we would call this National Parks Inside and Out because Jonathan was inside the Park Service for his 40 plus years, and I was outside at least the career ranks of the Park Service for my 50 years. And that brings different experience and different perspectives and different sense of what partnerships are all about. I, I probably have a little stronger sense of the need for partnerships than you know, a career professional does. Um, and that may be one place where we have some um, tension uh, in our and probably some others as well. Well, I thought it was a very unique approach because as you mentioned, Destry, it's in some aspects, you provide the inside perspective of the, the sausage machine. And then John is out there living it. And, and dealing with it on the ground and the, the two pieces that come together um, just really was really interesting. A, a great approach, I thought. And uh, for anybody who wants to know more about the, the National Park Service and politics, I mean, there's so much institutional knowledge that these two guys provide in this book. It's just incredible. Um, you know, mm -hmm. it would take more than an hour to go through each of the cases of political interference that uh, John and Destry lay out in this book. And I'm going to try and touch on a few and get them to, to tell some of the stories that they write about. But, but Destry, um, James Watt, Bill Horn, Bill Mott, the management policies, as well as ANILCA, the Alaska National Land, National Interest Lands Conservation Act, your memories of those battles and those individuals must be as fresh today as if they happened yesterday. Well, I'm also a pack rat. So I have, I have files. I have copies of all of Bill Horn's memos to Bill Mott when he was trying to rewrite the purpose of the National Parks idea um, and lots of other things associated with that period. You know, I, I debated James Watt on the Today Show one, one early one morning. Um, and you know, he, he sort of brought the most extreme 
for his time uh, point of view about what the parks were all about. And then, you know, he was out in a couple of years, but Bill Horn came in as the assistant secretary with the same views and Don Hodell as secretary had the same views, but Horn was the one who really bore in. And frankly, the only way the park service survived was that Bill Mott fought them tooth and nail every step of the way. Um, Bill had been in the park service. He was a career park man uh, before he was ever director. He was Ronald Reagan's state park director in California. And he was a board member of mine at NPCA before he was director. I picked him up at Dulles Airport when he flew east to be the director. And he had his 10 point plan on the back of an envelope that he read me as we drove into town. Um, and, you know, the management policies in that period went through about 20 iterations um, with Horn going one way and, um, and Mott going the other. Um, there's one quote of Horn's that we have in the book that I can't resist reading. And they were talking about the definition of impairment, um, you know, the sort of non-impairment standard. And Horn says, um, the revision to management policies should be guided by the principle that resource protection and providing visitor enjoyment are co-equal mandates. I think this is one place where Jonathan agrees strongly, they are not co-equal mandates. Even a rational interpretation of the Organic Act says they are not co-equal mandates. Preservation comes first and use that is compatible or does not cause impairment comes second. Um, there's always room for preservation, but it's got to be based in preservation of the use to begin with. And, and for those who aren't familiar, the, the management policies is, John, you could probably put it best, but it's kind of like the, the superintendent's rule book, right? It sits on their desk and if they're kind of lost over which direction to go, they pick up the, the management policies and it gives them the guidance they need. Is that right? Yeah, I wrote in uh, the beginning of the management policies chapter, management policies is an official document. It's the IKEA assembly of constructions cookbook and how to run a park for dummies. Um, and it basically sits on the desk of every park superintendent and it's earmarked and coffee stained. Uh, and it is the go-to document when you're faced with a proposal, uh, an idea that doesn't seem normal. And so you look to management policies and see where, where it, it, it applies or not. And it is, the, it is the umbrella that creates a system, a national park system, where you have you know, 400 plus units that are very, very different. They're in different ecosystems. They have different resources, both natural and cultural, but you need something that binds them together. And while you have a set of statutes, they, are, they tend to be fairly cryptic and management policies expands on that and gives superintendents the guidance that they need. And there ergo, it be, has become a target, a political target where the successive administration when Gail Norton was secretary, who was a protege of Jim Watt and Paul Hoffman was the deputy assistant secretary for Fish, Wildlife, and Parks overseeing the National Park Service. He took that Bill Horn interpretation and, and expanded it to say, basically, we could not impair visitor enjoyment. Right, right. Well, and we'll get into Bill Hoffman in, in, a, in a minute, um, or, or Paul Hoffman. But, but Destry, what exactly was Horn trying to do? What was he trying to take out of the management policies and put into it? And what was Bill Mott's position and how did he survive? Well, I'll answer the last part first. Mott survived because President Reagan protected him, or there was a perception that President Reagan wasn't going to let interior appointees fire him. So he just said what he thought and fought them tooth and nail every step of the way. Um, and he, he leaked me every every version of Horn's uh, statement, uh, every his, one of his memos, um, which I have on file and cited in the book. 
um, where he was trying to rewrite the purpose of the Organic Act, the intent of the Organic Act, and you know many things that ensued from it. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that he liked to say was um, that they had a responsibility to the Park Service. Uh, the parks have a responsibility to protect to protect the uh, visitor enjoyment. So therefore, things like protecting the scenic qualities of Yosemite Valley were important, but the health of the mule deer herd was not. And that was an explicit statement. Um, so, it, you know, it went downhill from there very rapidly throughout their time in office. Um, yeah. and, and those kinds of pulls and tugs, you know, I think another point we make in the book is that largely didn't exist for the first hundred years of the Park Service or of the parks from 1872 to 1972. And it all changed in December of 72 when Nixon fired Director Hartzog, first time a president had fired a director of the Park Service and instituted two other fundamental changes that have reshaped the politics of the parks that, have, that are still in effect. One was to empower the assistant secretaries with line authority over the bureaus. Prior to Nixon, assistant secretaries were staffed by the secretary. They, they went on assignment to do things the secretary wanted, but they had no um, line authority over the agencies. They didn't have authority to approve things. They didn't really have authority to disprove things. Um, they were just, <laughs> they were in the way, but um, uh, Nixon changed that. He empowered the assistant secretaries um, through executive order to be charge of the bureaus. And that was reflected in creating the Office of Management and Budget in the White House, OMB. Before that, it was just the Bureau of the Budget. And it was all about the money, and the money is important. Um, as Hartzog said, show me your budget and I'll tell you your policy. But uh, I, I think giving OMB and therefore the assistant secretaries management power, you know, that, that also created in each department an assistant secretary for policy management. And so those kind of insertions of senior politicians over the senior career officials of the Park Service um, have intentionally um, often ground them to a halt and sometimes made horrendously bad decisions and changes in direction for the Park Service. Yeah. Now, now John, while your brother was in Washington dealing in, in the, the, the meeting rooms and the argument rooms and whatnot with all the politicians and the various advocacy groups, you found your way up to Alaska in Wrangell St. Elias um, National Park and Preserve and kind of found yourself in a whole different type of political world, no? Uh, yeah, <clears throat> and um, i had always wanted to work in Alaska and um, had an offer earlier in my career, but declined and then uh, landed Wrangell St. Elias, largest park in the system, 13 million acres, um, an Anilka park. Um, and, um, and I like to say that while the conservation community, much of it led by Destry, um, and then established ANILCA through Congress, um, and then we had to figure it out how to implement it on the ground. We used to joke, we were like Talmudic scholars trying to reinterpret what they meant uh, in ANILCA uh, on issues like subsistence and access <clears throat> and uh, the role of the state and others. So it was, it was complicated. Plus, you know, I had the, uh, the three amigos up there, Ted Stevens, Frank Murkowski, and Don Young, um, all of whom had adamantly opposed the establishment of uh, the parks in, in Alaska um, and had their own view of how things were to be managed um, and were frequently on the phone with me or dragging me before a hearing or whatever. I will say Ted Stevens uh, would uh, beat us up in the hearing and then sneak us money 
uh, behind the scenes to do uh, projects. He was pretty supportive uh, behind the scenes. Um, uh, Frank just liked to fight uh, as, did, uh, as did Congressman Young. Um, and then, the, you know, the local politics were fascinating um, with the local community. And I, I found myself totally immersed in, in the native community, the native Alaskans who, you know, they're, they were never displaced as in the lower 48. So they, most of their rights were retained. And I found myself quite supportive of that and seeking ways to enrich the park through their continued uh, cultural association, their travel, their hunting, their subsistence activities, just different than the lower 48. And I, I certainly learned a lot through that process um, of, the, of the local politics and the local communities. What was really interesting, I mean, um, from my perspective was just, you're up there in Alaska and you had some of the similar situation um, down in Washington state when you later moved to North Cascades. But a lot of those meetings with the locals, sometimes they'd be in bars and, and the, the patrons would be armed. I mean, they, they, they cherished and loved these lands as much as everybody else did, but they had a little different perspective on, on how they should be managed. And they didn't think that they should have this new agency show up and tell them how to manage them um, and what rules they had to follow. I mean, yeah, so yeah, the that stories was, you tell in the book are great. Yeah, I, I said, uh, whenever I talked to my staff, when I was director, I said, well, you know, you haven't really done a public meeting unless it's in a bar and everybody's drunk and armed. Uh, and they're they're not happy about your message. Um, and I did a lot of those in Alaska and um, and actually in a bit of masochism, I enjoy them. I actually really enjoy interacting in, in those situations with people. And I think at the core, what we sometimes forget is local people like that really do care about the place. Uh, they care about it in many similar ways that we do. They just don't necessarily like the federal government telling them what they can and can't do. And so my, one of my mentors, Bob Barbie, who was the regional director up there used to say, any idiot can say no. Um, it's a lot harder to figure out how to say yes. And so one of the things I worked on was, and I will say also that the conservation community also had a little bit, no offense to my brother, skewed view of what Anilka said. Um, they, they hoped it said something, but often it didn't. For instance, the subsistence title 11 was written originally to give subsistence rights to native Alaskans, but at the last minute, it was converted to local rural. And, um, and that includes non-natives had subsistence rights within both the park and the preserve, the, the park and the hard park, as they call it in Alaska. And so the park service had to figure out that, how to, who's local and you know, what, you know, what the season of bag limits really were for or take of moose, caribou, bear, wolf, all of those things. And it's, it's a different world. Yeah, it certainly sounds like it. Now, we'll, we'll jump up to 2006. Um, you know, we, we went through the, the 70s and, and Bill Horn's attempts to rewrite the management policies. And 2006, I believe, was the last time that the management policies were rewritten or uh, revised. And at the time, um, that's where Paul Hoffman comes into play. And, and Destry, you note in the book that in September 2005, a federal judge ruled in a case involving Canyonlands National Park, I believe, and he held that the 2001 version of the management policies were an agency document intended to carry the force of law. Now, in January of 2006, the U.S. Court of Appeals in Washington, D.C., ruled that the management policies were, quote, a non-binding internal agency manual intended to guide and inform Park Service managers and staff. There is no indication, the court pointed out, that the agency meant for these internal directives to be judiciously enforceable at the behest of members of the public who question the agency's management. Now, did that ruling pretty much give fuel to Paul Hoffman's um, approach to rewriting the management policies and what he thought they should say? No, 
I'm sure he never read a court opinion before. Um, and I think what um, I think the key point here is that these policies guide the Park Service decision makers. You know, they're not ironclad, they're not absolutist policies, but they're meant to guide the agency. And as long as the policies are written in the context of and subservient to the statutes, they're perfectly legal for the Park Service to uh, impose or enforce on the agency. Um, and in the case of Canyonlands, you know, that the Salt Creek Wash road, so-called road, dirt track up the middle of the creek, um, you know, was causing serious environmental impact in a part of the park that was otherwise pristine and wild uh, because of the passage of four-wheel drive vehicles. And the Park Service, even in the face of that appeals court case, said, you know, we think we're right. This is a this is within our discretion to impose limits or restrictions on this kind of activity. And I, the many courts have upheld that um, uh, in many other places. Uh, I think the Salt Creek Wash Road is not open to four-wheel drive vehicles at present, at least not up to um, the arch that was the popular destination. Um, there's a short stretch that is. So there was a compromise there, but there's often compromise in, uh, in policy, um, just as Jonathan was describing in Alaska. You know, and I have to say, speaking of compromise, jumping back to Anilka for a second, um, you know, we celebrated the passage of Anilka in 1980 and the great work of the Carter administration and Secretary Anderson supporting it. But if you look back at George Hartzog's plan called Operation Great Land for parkland in Alaska, uh, his proposal was for 76 million acres of new parkland. And what the Park Service got was 44 million acres of new parkland. So uh, Anoka was a great victory and certainly over the objections of the Alaska congressional delegation, but it was not everything it could have sh or should have been. Um, and, you know, legislative compromise used to be the art of legislative process. Um, we don't see that as often anymore. It's absolutist. But um, in those days, people sat down and negotiated um, and on all sides um, and came out with something that made more people than not happy, um, at least outside of the state of Alaska. Yeah, yeah. We, we'd like to see compromise work from time to time. Now, John, you took a, a rather bold stance in your official comments on the Hoffman draft, um, I believe. You wrote in part that Hoffman, the draft was, quote, the largest departure from the core values of the National Park Service in its history, posing a threat to the integrity of the entire system. Why was it such a, su such a great threat? Well, that um, infamous memo, um, I was the only one of the regional directors that actually filed a formal memo regarding uh, Hoffman's rewrite of management policies. And what, what Paul was doing is every time a decision that a park superintendent was making, particularly to deny an activity that was maybe being proposed by a, a supporter of that administration to do something uh, in a park, if the superintendent cited chapter and verse and line of management policies, Paul would pull that up on his computer in Word and revise that section to make it possible for an individual to do these kinds of activities in the parks. For instance, the kind of, the way that policies are written now um, and still are when were written then, is that the onus on a, uh, on a proposal, the onus falls on the proposer to prove to the National Park Service this would have no significant impact. And Paul flipped that and he put it on the Park Service. And so anybody that proposed anything from 
a zip line in Yosemite to the top of Half Dome, it would, the, it would fall on the Park Service to prove that it had significant impact. Otherwise, it would be allowed. And so he was basically opening the door uh, through a rewrite of policies to all kinds of inappropriate activities just because they are being proposed. This is a, a straight line from Horn's interpretation as well. And so um, we really saw it as a significant threat uh, to the, the policies. And as I indicate in the book, Paul Hoffman's version of this rewrite was leaked, not by me, uh, but it was out there. And people could actually see because in Word, it says it shows the revision and who did it. And, uh, and it was throughout the document, you could see significant revisions all done by Paul. Did you fully appreciate at the time the, the professional risk you were taking by, by sending the, those comments up the line? Oh, yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, I got called back to Washington <clears throat> by uh, Director Fran Manella and uh, her deputy, Steve Martin, and uh, got my butt chewed uh, and threatened with, uh, with removal uh, from, from my position. What, what saved you? I uh, there I had a group of supporters out there. Um, the, certainly, the the conservation community was on to this, um, and uh, you know they were fighting this tooth and nail in the media at the same time, um, and um, and there was a great worry that my memo would uh, would appear in the press. And I, I tell that story about how it was, uh, I got a phone call to, uh, to fax that uh, memo to, uh, to Secretary Ken Salazar, uh, Senator Ken Salazar at the time, uh, which I did. And it was, uh, it was all part of the, the uh, a hold that uh, Senator Salazar had on Lynn Scarlett to be the Deputy Secretary. And, so there were a lot of politics at play there at the same time. You know, let me just say one thing about the outside voice at that time. You know, groups like NPCA and others were, were loud on this, but this was an opportunity for the National Park Service retirees that were active uh, retirees, um, Bill Wade and, um, um, Mike Finley and Rick Smith and others came to Washington, had a press conference at the National Press Club, um, denounced these policy directions, rallied, you know, a thousand or more other retirees to get involved. And, you know, they formed a, a, new, a new organization based on that set of events. And that organization, now called the Coalition for Deaf Americans and National Parks, still uh, is out there and um, doing great work, but it started based on that memo and that rewrite of management policies. Now, now jumping ahead to uh, the Obama administration, of course, John, you were uh, appointed the Park Service Director by the President and confirmed by the, the Senate. And one of the efforts you pushed through was basically to restate, in, in my opinion, to restate the Park Service's science mission. Is that correct? Is that a good, good synopsis? Well, I was the first director to have a science advisor, um, Dr. Gary Macklis. And I wanted someone, uh, you know, that was from the academic griddle that did not have supervisory or budgetary or line authority uh, that could, you know, speak truth to power and really particularly in regard to science. And I think you know, Destry and I are not scientists, but we, we have a background in science and we understand its value to the management of the national park system. And, you know, Destry led the effort to get a scientific science mandate in legislation, something the Park Service did not have. And, um, and we began the process of really sort of infusing that directly on issues of climate change, on, you know, more park specific issues like you know, bison uh, in Yellowstone uh, and so many of the other issues at the same time. And, and all of that sort of culminating in 
Director's Order 100 um, and the uh, Revisit Leopold Report. Is it, is it safe to say that, you know, George Mende is right, really started moving the Park Service in the science direction. And then, you know, he died in that tragic traffic accident with Roger Toll. Was there a, a big gap in, in the Park Service's approach to science between his loss, his death, and, and your directorship? Uh, or is that over, I, overstating things? Well, I would say it, there was a big gap from when he uh, tragically was killed in the car accident in the 30s. And then it sort of restarted in the 60s um, with the creation of the cooperative park study units, the relationships with universities. And we began to um, hire some scientists um, back into the service. But there was a big gap there. But at the time, also, there was, there was not an impetus in, within the service, uh, particularly in the superintendent ranks, to utilize science in the decision-making process. It was still about, you know, sort of a landscape architecture, operations, visitor services kind of approach to things. Um, and it really wasn't until the, the sort of late 80s that we got into the natural resource challenge. Um, but it was, a, I would say it was a slow progression uh, starting maybe in the 60s, 70s, um, and then leading up uh, to sort of where we are today, where we've got a lot of folks in the Park Service with strong science and cultural resources backgrounds uh, to, to lead the, the agency. With a significant step in there, Kurt, and that is that Congress passed the Clean Air Act Amendments in 1977 that for the first time distinguished national parks from all other air quality areas designating them as class one. Um, the basic provision of law called for prevention of significant deterioration of air quality and singled out protection of visibility, um, meaning scenic views in the eyes of the Park Service as a standard of science uh, and management. And it caused the Park Service to begin to hire air quality specialists. Um, they even um, went to the extent of designating what we tentatively called integral vistas that were the view sheds that were to be protected um, from air quality deterioration. Now that was then killed in 1981 when Watt came in as director and never became official policy. But the law is there, class one, all the national parks at the time in 77 are class one. And anything since then can be reclassified though nothing has been um, with uh, a process and state approval. Um, so that was a significant move in the science direction in the 70s. You know, I wasn't gonna go down that road because I didn't think I'd have enough time, but class one, um, air quality status, Chaco culture was an exception to that, no? Well, you may recall that Chaco uh, was originally a national monument. Um, right. Would have been protected under the, as class one, under that 77 amendment. But Congress very quickly, I might say with a Republican congressional delegation from New Mexico, redesignated Chaco as a national historic park so that it does not qualify for reclassification as class one. Hence, all the problems we have today with rampant uh, attempts at, at least attempts at oil and gas leasing uh, all around the ten, so-called 10 mile buffer in Chaco and the BLM outliers um, that surround the park. Um, but without an act of Congress at this point, we're not gonna have Chaco, perhaps the most, I'll say it, the, the most significant archeological park in the system in terms of the sophistication of the culture that's represented there. Um, it will never be class one without an act of Congress doing it. Yeah. Now, now John, um, revisiting Leopold, 
um, what was your goal with that? I mean, climate change was already being seen on the ground and whatnot. And in the, the document, one phrase that really sticks out is the precautionary principle. And so you have those two aspects, you know, the, the impacts of climate change and then the precautionary principle for, you know, all change and all impacts in the national park system. Um, what were you seeking to accomplish with that? What did the committee come back to you with? So <clears throat> I really start by thinking about the Leopold report itself, the one that Starker Leopold led <clears throat> as a science advisor and a Berkeley professor to the Secretary of the Interior, really focused on, in many ways, a wildlife problem, um, overpopulation of elk <clears throat> in, the, in the Yellowstone ecosystem. But Starker took it further than that and really created the oft used phrase, the vignettes of primitive America. Um, and we saw that that policy framework had guided the Park Service fairly well for the last 50 years. But there were things that Starker missed. And obviously at the time, things like climate change, um, things like indigenous stewardship and the recognition of, of thousands of years of of management of these resources before we came along. And, and that parks were now changing um, before our very eyes. And I certainly saw that it, in my tenure, like at Mount Rainier, uh, where we saw a dramatic shift in, in rain on snow to ha occur in the fall. And we saw a huge uh, flooding into areas that had never really flooded in the past. We saw fires burning uh, year round, expanding the fire season and forests not coming back. And so managers needed some tools. Um, and <clears throat> while we had launched a number of these efforts like a, a climate strategy, a no regrets plan, we'd stood up a climate office. I hired some top flight climate scientists like Patrick Gonzalez, who's member of the IPCC uh, and others, we needed to get it into policy. We needed to give, just like management policies, give the field some guidance. And so we tasked the National Park System Advisory Board, uh, chaired um, by and made up of extraordinary minds, extraordinary scientists um, that had worked and thought about all of these things to help us write a document that, that would, like the Leopold Report, that we could then convert into policy. And I basically wanted to give park superintendents, um, you know, a set of tools that they could take action. Um, and the precautionary principle is one of those sort of guidance doc components about um, sort of taking anticipatory action uh, and to address climate change within, within the resources that are in their care and in their stewardship. Um, and um, that, because we, you know, the time scale is much shorter now than it, than it used to be in terms of what we're seeing on the ground. And of course, um, talking about parks and politics, when the Trump administration came into office, director's order 100 left. Is that safe to say? Yeah, it was officially rescinded, uh, <clears throat> but I would suggest that perhaps it's laying around on a few desks out there. <clears throat> uh, he couldn't rescind the revisit Leopold report because that's an independent report coming from a, a citizen's body. So that still stands uh, out there. And I have hope that this administration will uh, uh, either restore it or even revise it and update it. Yeah, yeah. Now, John, as director, you weren't exactly uh, immune from political pressures um, during your tenure, I don't think. Um, there was the, the plastic water bottle, the reusable plastic water bottle issue or um, plastic water bottles that go, got thrown out. Um, and there was a policy that you put in place to allow superintendents to phase out plastic bottles or allow plastic bottles, but it, as some people said, had a lot of hoops 
that the superintendents had to jump through to to get that permission. And there was the uh, complaints that Coke, Coca-Cola had some pressure on that decision. Um, there was also the issue of at Big Cypress National Preserve down in Florida, the case of 40,000 acres in the addition lands that at one point in time had been deemed suitable for wilderness designation. Um, but when the final GMP for the wilderness, for the additional lands came out, those 40,000 acres were open, I believe, to ORV use. And that was a plan that acting Park Service Director um, Dan Wenk approved. You know, we can move on to, to Point Reyes with uh, the oyster farm on one end of the national seashore and, and the cattle ranching on the other end of the national seashore. Politics played all a role in these decisions, didn't they? They do play uh, a role in all of these decisions and that's politics with a big P and with a little P. Uh, big P meaning members of Congress, senators, Congress people uh, weigh in. Um, <clears throat> you know, speaking of Florida, you know, when we were proposing a, a no-take uh, fishing area um, in Biscayne, every member of Florida's congressional delegation called me personally uh, to uh, ask that we not do it. Um, <clears throat> certainly in the Point Reyes situation, uh, a senior Democratic Senator, Diane Feinstein, called me uh, repeatedly. Her husband called me uh, and uh, basically requesting that I fire Don Neubacher um, the, the superintendent uh, so that, uh, that the oyster farmer uh, could continue. Um, and so, you know, you, um, you pick your battles uh, and, uh, you know, small P or politics are the, are the staffers that work for those members and the, the folks that are in the Department of Interior that may be aligned uh, with one side or the other or looking to you know, not make an enemy. They may have plans for their future career path. And so they're, they're trying to make sure that you make a decision that doesn't block their future aspirations and all of that. So yeah, the, any one of these decisions that roll up to the director of the National Park Service have, have a lot of politics behind them. And you have to weigh you know, I always say that, you know, we're in the perpetuity business. Sometimes the timing is not right to do something um, because of the consequences uh, that could fall on the service itself uh, or on other aspects of the service. Um, the precedents that could be set uh, in one way or the other, and you try to eliminate all of that. Um, and, and to recognize too that, you know, some of these threats are real, uh, that Congress can legislate something. If you do it you know, administratively within policy, then maybe down the road, you can fix it. Um, uh, as opposed to you know, putting up a hard line and then having Congress legislate it, and then you're, then you're really stuck with it. And so all of that goes into the calculus that that any director has to face uh, with these kinds of decisions. Now, now certainly um, pulling, pulling the National Park Service out of the Interior Department, which you gentlemen um, call for towards the end of your book, would remove some of those politicians from the chain of command. But would it really remove the Park Service from those political pressures from senators and representatives calling you up from, from gateway communities saying, we don't want reservation systems because we want as many people to come into these parks and eat at our restaurants and you know, stay at our hotels. How, do you, how does an independent agency avoid those types of pressures? Well, I'll start, but I want Destry to jump in on this too. The, um, you can't avoid it. Um, I mean, an independent agency is not removed from the politics. They're not removed from certainly the oversight committees, the appropriations committees, uh, all of the, the oversight responsibilities of the US Congress, just like the Smithsonian is subject to that as well. It does remove you, the, the, the agency from 
the, the small p politics of the Department of Interior. So when, when an administration changes, the Department of Interior is about 70,000 employees, roughly. They bring in 100 politicals come in at the top and they are all aligned to the secretary to the White House. And there's, it's a mixed bag. There'll be a, you know, assistant secretaries, as Jeffrey pointed out, deputy assistant secretaries, assistant secretaries, management assistants, and all of those. And their knowledge of the mission, the value of the National Park Service is, a, is they may not know the Park Service from the Boy Scouts. Um, and, you know, I, I, I mean, I remember I was, this was when I was regional director, I was sitting in acting as the chief of staff to the director at, the, at that time, it was to, Fr to Fran Manella, and I was acting as chief of staff. And a young political comes walking in, he goes, I, I have a great idea. Let's open up all the national parks to hunting. It will satisfy so many of our constituencies out there. Just open them up. And I just said, you know, that's the dumbest idea I've heard all day, you know? And I said, the second you propose that, you're gonna be looking for a job. And I said, even in this administration, they're not gonna open up the national parks to hunting. And, and there were probably some people who would like to, but that's just not politically viable. And so you spend all of this potentially positive energy when you're, you're in this environment, fending off, you know, you know, really bad ideas, the carving of Ronald Reagan's face on the front of El Capitan in Yosemite. I mean, you know, scuba diving on the USS Arizona. Uh, um, I mean, just every day, there's all these things that boil up from these, these politicals and getting that out of the way. And also the, the flipping that you would see. And I think the Trump administration is probably the best example of the political influence that can happen. Cleaned out our senior executive service from the top down, moved everybody, people retired. You saw what happened to Dan Wink, Sue Maska, many others. No director for four years, nothing but actings. Um, leaving the parks open uh, during the government shutdown and all of the ensuing damage associated with that. Um, and, uh, and many superintendents were pulled back to Washington and read the riot act about speaking to the media about anything uh, controversial. So they're just the long laundry list of, of, and all of that was coming out of the executive branch, not coming out of, out of Congress. Yeah. Destry? Well, I would just say, we don't expect or intend to get rid of politics. There's no question about that. But I will use the example of the uh, first midterm in um, the Clinton administration when um, uh, there was a complete sweep uh, of control from Democrat to Republican in the Congress. Newt Gingrich became Speaker of the House and issued his contract, what I called contract on America, uh, contract for America. Um, and Congressman Jim Hansen, the chairman of the Parks Committee, uh, it introduced legislation to establish his park closing commission. They were going to set up a process to close, get rid of every unit of the park system that didn't have uh, a, a real purpose from their point of view or enough visitation to justify their existence. Um, and they reported that bill out of committee, but they lost badly on the floor. Um, they tried to bring it up under suspension and lost. That means a majority of Republicans opposed it. Um, they tried to bring it up as a straight uh, vote and lost again. They tried to add it to the uh, budget and lost. Um, so the, the support of the American people, the popularity of the national parks is its great bulwark against excessive politics being successful. That's not going to prevent administrations from trying, but Bill Mott could have been 
one of the greatest directors in Park Service history, but he had to spend all of his time fighting the petty politics of the department. Um, and so the Park Service needs to get away from some of that. It used to be prior to the Reagan administration, the Park Service was allowed independent of the department to file a legislative report on what it professionally thought about any piece of legislation, irrespective of what position the administration took. That didn't prevail necessarily in the administration's position, but it was known what the Park Service thought from a professional point of view. I wanna get back to a time when the Park Service can express publicly its professional views and let politics fall, let the chips fall where they may and I will guarantee you 90% of the time, the American people are gonna come down on doing what's right for the preservation of the national park system. And you know the politics, the partisan politics that we've seen in the last 15 years will not prevail. Let's hope not. Um, we're, we're almost out of time, but I did wanna try and get a couple of questions in. Um, one question is um, <clears throat> after listening to your discussion, and working in the park service for 10 plus years, it seems like the type of monumental change that we saw in Alaska can only come from the top leadership or from outside the Department of the Interior pressure, such as from the media or the elected officials. So what, what do you recommend current employees of the park service do moving forward to see your vision come to fruition? Uh, yeah. I'll start. <clears throat> well, I, first of all, uh, to all the Park Service employees that are out there uh, listening, thank you for what you do every day. Um, I know you're out there defending the parks um, under heavy visitation and not a very big budget and lots of challenges. And, and I think uh, the professionalism of the organization is the key to its long-term success. Um, I think recognizing um, that this is going to take some time. This is not going to be an overnight kind of thing. Any norm was Alaska uh, and Anilka, that it's going to take a coalition of individuals who care deeply about the mission and about the, the way the American public feel about their national parks uh, to accomplish something like this, to create a sustainable, independent uh, agency uh, akin to, to the Smithsonian. I mean, uh, just as in, again, during the Trump administration, Lonnie Bunch became the president director of the Smithsonian, an extraordinary professional, um, and led that organization while the Park Service had no one in that chair. And I think that that's, to me, just gives me this enormous contrast uh, of the, the need to make these kinds of changes. I would say, again, falling back on the Anilka example, Anilka was successful the first time before or since that the whole Congress has rolled a delegation from a state when the legislation only affected that one state. And they did so because of the grassroots support that the Alaska coalition developed through enormous uh, investment of staff and money across the country and having uh, Congressman John Cyberling, who chaired this special Alaska committee, willing to conduct field hearings to give people the opportunity to come out and express themselves in dozens and dozens of places that physically have nothing to do with Alaska, but allowed the American people to express their desire to see what was done right for Alaska. Um, it will take another coalition of that magnitude to do this. And I'm not suggesting that one exists, but what does need to change, you know, we see um, groups like NPCA, stalwart defenders of the parks, and, you know, are, are always there to fight both for the budget and for new areas. Many of the other national conservation organizations are all for new parks but are not at the table when it comes to adequately funding the Park Service. You know, we've seen over the years, many efforts to 
to do what Congress recently did with the American Great Outdoors Act of funding a big chunk of backlog funding for the Park Service. But it started with Stephen Mather, who got the Public Health Service to do a report on the condition of the parks, the deplorable condition of the parks in 1917. You know, and the Civilian Conservation Corps opened 80 camps in the national parks to do construction and maintenance. And Mission 66 spent billion dollars from 56 to 66 to restore the parks. And, <laughs> and on and on. I mean, the Bicentennial Land Heritage Program, the Park Restoration Improvement Program, and Great American Outdoors. So there have been efforts on the part of the conservation community and the Park Service and its supporters to both fund and authorize new parks you know, throughout its history. It's just gotten treacherously political in the last 50 years in ways that didn't exist for the first 100 years. Yeah, it has. It has. We'll take one more question. Um, we're running out of time. Um, what are your views on the evolution and the future of national heritage areas? Well, I'll start. I think uh, Destry and I are both fans of, of heritage areas. Um, I think they have, they fill a gap um, in a broader system of parks. Is uh, you probably know the National Park Service was very involved in the early days of establishing the state park systems, recognizing that the Park Service could not manage them all. And then there are places now that I think the heritage areas fill that uh, a space in that gap where communities, towns, and rich natural and cultural resources need to be preserved, but not necessarily with an overlay of a national park unit. Um, I think the heritage area system, I believe, needs some form of organic act um, in order to ensure that they are sustainable and they need to have sustainable funding um, that gets leveraged extraordinarily from uh, the communities that, uh, that operate these heritage areas. But I'm, I'm a fan and I think they're, uh, they're very important. Uh, S 1942 is that National Heritage Area Systems Act that is pending in the Congress, um, and I think you know should be supported. Um, these individual ones, there's whatever 56, 57 of them now, or something like that, um, that have been established by individual acts of Congress. You know, they were originally called. Ronald Reagan signed the first one, the Illinois Mission Canal, um, and said it's a new form of national park. Um, and the ones that have been established since then, you know, they're not national parks, but they bring a level of land use planning and cohesion and vision to particular landscapes that they didn't have or that were not effective in espousing their values before that designation. So with just a little bit of park service money and technical assistance, these places, many of them have flourished like they never would have done without that designation. Um, I'm not suggesting that they all be taken by any means taken over by the Park Service, but there's a variety of them, just like there's a variety of other creative efforts to rethink you know, what could and should be done with the American landscape. Like the Pinelands National Reserve in New Jersey, a million acre national reserve 600,000 acres of which has been protected in the 40 or so years since it was authorized through transfer of development rights from developers who buy easements in rural open space in order to get more dense development in towns and cities. That approach has not been used anywhere else, but it worked magnificently in that case and should be looked at. And there, you know, there's a whole movement for large landscape conservation across the country doing all kinds of creative approaches that aren't national parks, but are attempting to achieve a new federal uh, opportunity for landscape conservation, wildlife habitat protection, historic and cultural landscape protection, and so forth. And you know, they're all good things. You know, gentlemen, I was I was right when I said at the top of the hour that uh, 
there's more than enough information and, and topics to discuss um, for two or three hours. And unfortunately, we're we're just about out of time now. Um, you know, one of the questions that I was curious to, to ask, I didn't get around to, and I'm sure many other folks have questions. And when they get your book and, and read through it, they'll they'll be amazed at some of the, the stories that you tell about how things transpired, but they'll also come up with their own questions. But I, I guess I'd like to close this with, is Congress ready? Is, is there interest in Congress to see this happen? Not today. <laughs> Yeah, I think, you know, Congress <clears throat> moves at times uh, to do good things. They fully funded the Land and Water Conservation Fund, the Great America's Outdoors Act. And those were built over time by uh, smart politicians on the Hill, people that know how to move big pieces of legislation forward. Um, but they don't move them without broad public support. And I think what's really interesting to me is that, you know, in these times when there are so many negative things that are creating anxiety in our lives, whether it's climate change or inflation or the war in U Ukraine or COVID or whatever, you know, the parks are up there as something that can inspire us. And there is a, there is a new future for their long-term sustainability, their long-term protection. And we need the agency itself. We need all of its advocacy organizations. We need the, the, the public. I mean, the 300 plus million people that go to national parks are not all Democrats. They are a broad spectrum uh, of American citizens and international citizens. And there needs to be a clarion call uh, to to take action, to get this done, um, so that for the next 100 years, um, we can have, be assured that this set of resources really are truly protected and managed sustainably and well for future generations. You know, when, when Bruce Vento was chairman of the Parks Committee in the House, God rest his soul, he held a hearing um, at which former director Bill Whalen testified about making the Park Service an independent agency. Um, and it takes leadership from the top. You know, right now, you know, there's no Bruce Vento. There's no Phil Burton. There's no Dale Bumpers. There's no Scoop Jackson. Um, and lots of other people that have played seminal roles in the evolution of the national park system. Um, and it takes time for those people to get knowledgeable enough and enthused enough about new directions um, to make things happen. And that ain't, that's not gonna happen this year, um, but it'll, the windows of opportunity, the pendulum you know, swings back um, and there'll come a time when this idea works. Well, gentlemen, thank you so much for your time this evening. And uh, certainly your book, as it circulates around, will, will hopefully spur some, some wider conversations about what exactly politics are doing to the National Park System and the National Park Service. Again, National Parks Forever, 50 years of fighting in a case for independence. Gentlemen, best of luck with your book. May it become a bestseller. Good to see you, Wally and Jerry. <laughs> Next, next month on yeah. National Parks Travelers webinar, we're going to continue talking about the National Park Service with another important issue about funding and the lack of funding in many areas. So we hope you'll see us next month. For The Traveler, this is Kurt Repencheck.